So you, you've, you've done your placement, you finish, you have to now return to, to uni. So how easy was it to readjust? Well, it, was, it was much harder for me, I think, because I was also coming maybe a year later, if you consider it like that. So most of my friends had graduated the year prior. Um, I still have friends in this year and I made friends, yay. <laughs> but um, that I was relatively new to the year and um, I'd spent two years in, first and second year, and then two years out my gap year into my league. Uh, my um, placement year um, so I think it was maybe a bit more tricky for me to adjust um, mm -hmm. but then again everyone was finding it tricky because we just come out of COVID so or rather we were in COVID but getting into it a bit more I think ours was the first year which was less effective um, and I just managed to chance it that all my experience fell into parts where I didn't need to be affected by COVID as such okay. um, but yeah so it took quite a while to work away from the I mean, we were always promoted to do the nine to five working structure because that's what we've been doing in our placement years. That's also better because you're not like um, doing everything last minute and late yeah. night working. Um, <laughs> that kind of dissolved a little bit because, I mean, as, as, as structured as, as you know, I would say it's more structured doing the placement year work. And then when you come into final year, it's kind of like a you're in it. You, you make your work now. You have to design everything. And I'm just like... No. It was a bit of a struggle to get into that again um, because it wasn't that the work was easier when I was on placement, but everything was a bit more spread out because it was a joint effort, whereas final year is very much a back to yourself. Back to yourself again. All right. Mm. So um, let's talk about um, your experiences on the final year. Then we'll, we'll talk a bit about um, your project. So in terms of the final year, uh, what did you choose for your asset optional module? I chose 3D printing. Oh, okay, chose 3D printing, okay. Yeah. All right, yeah, because um, again, with, with the medical field, I mean, I think that's kind of like, you know, the the, the next big thing, and it's a manufacturer, especially. Well, mass, mass customization, I think, is what you can get with 3D printing. So, yeah. Right. Plus, I've always been a nerd for it, so that's why I chose it. <laughs> uh, all right, cool. Okay, so um, so you've, you've, you've gone to, um, so you're now starting the final year. So... In terms of the mm -hmm. amount of work that you had to do and the amount of information that you had to collect, do you believe that that kind of set you up adequately to undertake your uh, final project? Yes, I mean, because I had a much greater appreciation for actually what goes into making like a working, um, maybe not product, working prototype by the end. Mm. Um, that. I basically took that template and I think most of my report templates and my uh, sort of like uh, data, my um, time logging things was from my placement year. So I kind of just like used that template of working um, and brought it across from my final year project. Um, is obviously adapted a little bit because like different things we had to tap into and um, we were starting from scratch really uh, for final year project. Um, and it kind of came in ebbs and flows. Like I would like be really ahead in some weeks and then be like, oh, really cool. And then take it maybe a bit too chill and then be like, oh, no, no I'm, now I'm behind again. And it kind of just went up and down, up and down, up and down. But I think that's just the nature of working. I mean, university working is very different to outside working. Uh, no matter how you try, it's, it's just a weird environment. You're like slightly isolated from reality. Um, <laughs> but you can get some cool stuff. So, yeah. Okay. All right, sure. So um, let's talk about your, your, your final project, your final year project. So what was mm -hmm. it exactly? It was a toy container and applicator for children with eczema. That's its tagline for you. <laughs> and it was effectively, um, it's trying to make the, the, the treatment of eczema, um, trying to tackle all the issues that come into it. So that's scratching, um, having your medication always to hand, the organization mm -hmm. of medication, um, and basically just trying to make it uh, like the actual treatment application, um, greater adherence with um, the children themselves. So they learn how to take care of themselves from a younger age. Mm -hmm. And you can only do that by making it fun. So I was effectively making a toy which stored medication inside it, but it also had like a, a Peltier plate in the bottom to do yeah. some soothing cooling. So instead of yeah. harmful scratching, 
uh, you can't tell a kid not to scratch, so you scratch with the, the device instead. So it was try it was basically an all in one eczema treatment product um, yeah. that was kid friendly. And what's the one? What's the motivation behind you defining that particular brief? Well, I also kind of knew all the way from the start when I first applied to Lafra that I was maybe going to do an eczema based um, final year project, and that's just purely because. Oh, I suppose yeah that. Should have answered that for a question right at the start. <laughs> the reason I went into design really um, and knew that it was the right course for me is I did an EPQ um, on eczema as well, where I did a 3D printed medical aid. Um, so it was like a different type of skin, which like as you scratched it, it shifted the second skin rather than your own skin. So you didn't like actually tear open your um, your wounds or anything like that. And I designed that for my younger brother um, because he's always had really severe eczema. And um and then I was just like, I really like this field, but I don't think that product quite adjusts that need. So I knew that down the line, I would be doing something similar, but hopefully a bit more successfully. Um, so I think, yeah, just always like having had, like when growing up an issue very close to home, um, I think that's often the case with design students mm -hmm. um, with their final year project choice. Um, you choose something which you know a lot about and just sort of seeing the pain of not being able to help um, again, is what drove me towards medical design, um, not being able to help um, when he was like, obviously suffering, but like no one can help. It's like, it's just like some one of those inevitable things. Um, so how can you make it a slightly easier process or maybe try and tackle it before any, any of the itch occurs. So um, yeah. yeah, that was my motivation for doing eczema, really. Okay. All right. Cheers for that. Um, so at least, you've, at least you've got something there. At least you've got a, a personal stake. Uh, hmm. the project so that does help uh, <laughs> yeah so let's let's talk about let's the, the, the first half of it so that will be um semester one where we yeah. had to do more of a discovery around your brief then hopefully all that thinking converges to some form of end solution so mm -hmm. talk, 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 talk me through uh your your your, your thoughts in terms of how you went about, you know, undertaking a variety of activities to get that needed information to help you come up with some form of um, solution mm. that eventually will have to go into further development to give you something much more uh, realistic or close to yeah. that will work in real time. So is that what my process is effectively? So like how, yeah. I just kind of went ham on research, to be honest. I mean, it was it was something that I'd been researching for a while, but I need I needed to document everything and sort of look at all the different aspects I wanted to potentially tackle. Um, so, I mean, at the start of it, it was reading quite a lot of the collative reports, so uh, literature reports from other people and from quite big eczema organisations, uh, both in America and England. Um, so I would say that was easier than me reading like 12, 20 different individual reports also because mm -hmm. um uh, everything in the medical field is always ever evolving so i knew i needed the most relevant and up-to-date information so there's no use like reading something from like 2000 um because treatment changes and that was the main issue that came about actually that i was trying to address too um so in terms of research it was looking at very current things i also went a bit towards more like social media which i guess is a slightly fresher um design research tool um than maybe like the much um, old, older previous years um, is looking at like sort of um, ambassadors. There's quite a lot of like bloggers and sort of mummy bloggers, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I was looking for like personal recounts. Obviously I had my own story, but I wanted to hear what, I didn't want to just be designing for myself or my family. It needed to also be applicable to like lots of other people. Um, so I was looking for personal recounts, but at like a global scale, I guess. Um, and then it was consolidating that all into what's what has changed since I originally started researching this. So what new products have come onto the market, uh, making sure I wasn't infringing on anything too badly, or at least do something novel with each of the concepts. Um, so it was papers, uh, then towards the ambassador side. So looking at um, lots of YouTube videos as well. I think I ended up with a playlist of like, 150 videos um, about random. It wasn't just about eczema as a as a topic. It was also starting to consider the actual product it could become. 
um, mm. containers and things like that and all the mechanisms that go behind it. Um, so it's just seeing really, I think semester one was seeing what was out there um, and then seeing if there was a gap in between things or in my case, what I could marry together all of the things um, to try and make my product. Um, so I really, I found my end product through just merging a bunch of like existing sort of solutions, um, I guess. And you only know those solutions are out there if you go looking for them um, because I wanted it to be working prototype, which it ended up being so. Yeah, I think that was that was semester one was it was setting that stage, really. Um, lots of reading, lots of watching, um, and then just trying to isolate out what I wanted to do further. And it was really reassuring because I actually got an expert interview as well. I squeezed in right at the end um, with like the chief nurse of the Med um, the Eczema Society in England. And um, she basically validated what I wanted to go forward as the concepts. So I was like, oh, fantastic. <laughs> it, must, it must mean I'm going along the right sort of tracks. Um, but I could only get there by um, initially having a scope out of the current solutions or what's currently being used to solve the issue. Um, and if it hasn't solved it, why hasn't it solved it? And how could it be solved sort of thing? Hmm. Okay. All right. Cheers for that. So, all right. So that was uh, the, the, the first half of uh, what you had to do. So let's talk a bit more about the, the, the second half. So you now mm -hmm. got done undertaking all this amount of research. You've now have an idea in terms of where you want to take um, um, the solution through. So what were the most, what were the activities they had to undertake to yield the final finalized solution to satisfy your uh, requirements? I think it was, well, actually, I only involved electronics in the second semester itself. So before that, I wasn't actually, it was just like a mechanical product. Um, so in order to incorporate any electronics, I knew it had to be a feasible, tangible thing. So, I mean, second semester, it was actually bringing the thing to life. So doing lots and lots of 3D printed iterations, as well as just like rough, rough models. Because um, I think I ended first semester with like my very first um, usability prototype was literally just like old packaging with like plasticine around it and um i stand by it plasticine's a great modeling tool because like <laughs> especially for usability um if the grip that you've modeled doesn't work they'll form it themselves um and it was just sort of like getting things underhand i guess so actually building um everything that was in theory everything that was researched in first semester all is all well and good um but it's only gonna you're only gonna know if it does work if it's actually built or you actually make it um that was a, especially important i mean it's not often the, always the case but it was important for my project because i had like a mechanical dosing element so i needed to feel that there was like tangible clicks i needed to feel that it was actually decanting things and i could test that um the reliability of it as well um so semester two bringing it from paper basically or for, I, more realistically from the cad screen um into like someone's hands, into my own hands even, um, was basically the main aim of the game. And um, it's what actually um, helped me iterate forwards because I did so many different um, 3D printed iterations. There were like 40 off models by the end of it. Like I did a lot of physical work, but that's what I needed. Because um, sometimes to know if a product works, it needs to be made. Um, there's no way of getting around it. Okay. Uh Purchase that. And were you able to succeed in getting something that at least showed the fund show the basic functionality of the product? Were you able to achieve that? Yeah, so I actually I ended up with a um I think what they <laughs> uh so someone commented on a LinkedIn post from our degree show, um, which riled up a few people, but I think he had he said something which was quite relevant, which is the works like looks like models. So the ones which like all the electronics and mechanics are packaged inside what it's meant to look like, reflective of colours, maybe even of um, material finish. Um, and I was lucky enough that I did actually get that. Maybe not in time for the full submission. So I did actually end up doing like a full Peltier activated um, toy mode and then like the mechanical twisting one I'd had done from like week four of semester two. Um, but I had all of that um, uh, by the end of it. So there were basically two working prototypes at the end, one which... Uh, and that was purely just due to battery size, uh, one which powered the Peltier and the electronic sort of main functionality, and the other which was the mechanical element, which was the twisting of the like shape doses, the love hearts or the the stars. So 
yeah, I was I was quite fortunate in finding technology which actually existed that I could fit in such a small package because my product was only about like yay big. Um, and I did just repurpose existing electronics. I know that people who did things a bit more from scratch, so with breadboards and everything like that, Arduinos, they're a bit chunkier. Um, so with lots of the handheld models, maybe you, you can't quite get to that. Um, but I was lucky enough that I did. Okay. All right. Cheers for that. So overall, did you enjoy the learning experience? Yeah, I mean, it was, I don't know. On to finish it eventually? Uh, finish the FIDP project or the, no, the group like your entire experience, your entire the entire thing. Yeah. <laughs> you my goodness, it? it's been, yeah, no, I've enjoyed, I mean, I've enjoyed it enough to recruit in quite a lot of my family into the design school and some friends. Um, so, well, this yeah, I think it's, then. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get a discount off my tuition but uh, um yeah no so i mean i I've, I've greatly enjoyed it i've always known that i wanted to use creativity but like help people with it and i think that this course gives you up to do that um so i don't know I, i've always just been incredibly positive i know that there's, there's always going to be like little niggles and stuff throughout the course and there's always like your own personal roller coaster ups and downs like emotional wise and everything like that yeah. um but by and large, I think the course is great. I think it's, it's set me up to have a career. Um, and I keep just like stumbling upon things. And I'm just like, oh, cool. So like stuff I was doing in university and like stuff I enjoyed doing, I can get paid for it now. <laughs> people would have known, but you don't know that until you have your shiny degree and your people offering you jobs and everything like that. So um, yeah, it, it, yeah, I think it's been really great. All right, cool. And how's the job hunting going? Like, or are you taking time out to rest, recuperate before you... Oh, I'm already taken. I'm taken from my um my placement company about two weeks prior to um um to the degree show. They actually got in contact with me again and was just like, "We have this really exciting opportunity. It's more of like a startup within our parent company." So I worked in R and D before, but now I'm basically going to be like the designer for this like small team like launch okay. off. Um, so I was like, "Oh, fantastic!" I mean, like, I I left my um my placement company it was consultancy work and I was like oh do I really want to go into consultancy there seems to be like some shifting around of responsibility but this one this job seems to be like staking your claim in it so I'm so excited and yeah I've, I've been welcomed back by both that placement company starting in September and then I also did a placement prior to my <laughs> prior to my actual placement um which was with a ex um, Loughborough alumni uh doing like a a safety project for bikes Mm -hmm. um, and I'm actually doing summer work with him. So no rest for the wicked. I'm straight into work. <laughs> okay. Congratulations. That's, that's, Thank that's, you. That's, that's, that's nice to hear. Okay. So when you actually start? So I started my my summer job um, last week, uh, but that's just a few days in London. The rest of it's just homeworking. Um, and then I start my actual career placement, career job, should I say. I keep saying placements. My career <laughs> on the 7th of September is oh, when okay. I start. You've got, you've got time to at least. So where's that base? Is that in Cambridge? or That's in Kent. So this is in one of Kent. the medical okay. companies that have escaped the Cambridge Mafia. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> but yeah. All right, cool. All right. So, so that's, that's, that's quite interesting. So hopefully um, I'll be able to at least catch up with you once you've um, settled in for a year just to kind of like... Um, a follow up to see how yeah for sure and then how you've grown into the role and things like that so mm. and hopefully that also at least set the foundation for us to probably talk about your your own philosophy when it comes to design because I'm very certain mm -hmm. that it will be a ver a variation of what you know in terms of the double diamond so so that'll be that'll be quite interesting because again you know as as you progress you start to start looking at different approaches to then define what defines you as a designer and what works for you. So yeah. that'll, that'll be quite interesting uh, to, to have a chat about. All right, so we're, we're coming um, towards towards the end. So um, I think at this point I've just got like one major major question to, to ask, and that would be what advice would you give to any young person? So any young um, uh, man or woman who is interested in pursuing your line of work, which is um, being a product designer. So what advice would you give uh, someone that is considering um, studying product design 
what advice would you give to someone in terms of what they need to uh, anticipate and probably start developing to cope with the amount of work um, moving forward? So if they want to mm. either uh, go into uh, go to uni as you did, or if they want to go to uh, f- f- uh, do it through further education or whether through a polytechnic, even if they're are oh, polytechnics existing anymore? They exist. what do they need to do in terms of what do they need to study? What are the fundamental things that they need to study? What are the things that they need to develop and practice on? And what about um, the interpersonal skills that they also need to uh, develop and refine um, in preparation mm-hmm. towards the, the work that uh, is expected of someone who's trying to progress um, in the field of either engineering or product design or even industrial design? Big old question there, isn't it? <laughs> talk to so many so many of the secondary school students who I talked to in the degree show, I had like good 30-minute conversations, but I'll try and boil it down a little bit. <laughs> um, I think uh, the main point of advice, first of all, like to tackle that, I think that's like a two-part question there, is that um, how do you prepare yourself and then what can you do to like sort of get yourself into it? Um, so how to get into it and I think what gives um, a designer or especially like I guess um, this type of like the designer of this age uh, an edge is just having a huge knowledge base of like <laughs> I cannot say having a huge knowledge base of everything but I mean going out into the world and seeing lots of things um, so that's what I mean you don't have to I think there's a false perception that you invent everything and that only good products that are made are pure inventions that's not the case it's often just rehashes or reorganizations of things um it doesn't have to be um something so novel it just needs to be um your own twist on things and i think the best products often just come about through like a collection of things and you only know what to collect if you have things to draw from so it's like being an artist and never going to art galleries um get out into the see what's in the design world um you don't have to find like an idol to like <laughs> follow by and abide by i think that's mm. there's often a bit of contention actually with some of like the more traditional design idols most people in the design school don't actually like them just purely because they're so like emphasizing it's kind of like a eye roll situation but um it's more just like it's not even you don't have to just target things which are design related it's just like going out and seeing just trying to observe everything i think it's just like don't just take things at face value think about what goes behind objects because that is ultimately what design is um uh it's it's the thought behind how things come about really um so in terms of getting into design i would say just look at the world um with open eyes and an open mind really um try and see what other people have done and see where you can fit in or where you can lead the way um that's how to get into design how to prepare yourself for design. I would say 90% of it is communication. Um, It's something that I've struggled with a little bit and I'm still working towards as well. Um, But it's just the best um, team teammates and the best like people you can collaborate with are those you can communicate with the best. Um, And the people who will have the the winning uh, pitches or everything like that, people who will take on client work are people who can sell themselves and people who can sell the products they're trying to design. So if you can't explain something, um, (laughs) this might be a bit ironic. Obviously, I've waffled quite a lot in some of my answers. But if you can't um, explain anything visually um, very quickly, um, then you're putting yourself at quite a big disadvantage. Um, So uh, quite a lot of that comes down to confidence. Um, That's what I've noticed, at least. Um, You just need to have confidence and then your ideas can have confidence through you. Um, because you need to believe in yourself first before you can believe into anything that you put out. Otherwise, everything's just going to come across as slightly um, sort of cautious and then some people might not take a chance on you, unfortunately. Um, So I would say um, communicating confidently. That doesn't have to be the traditional pitching ideas. Some people aren't talkers. Um, They're more like just doers and then like showers, I guess. (laughs) Um, But just... If it's sketching, if it's CAD, if it's talking through your um, your ideas, just find which works for you. Um, and if you can't find that, then try your best to develop that um, because so much of design is just visual communication um, or oral communication, just any communication. 
<laughs> that's my that's my words of advice. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. So that brings us to the end of um, this interview. So once again, I'd like to thank you, uh, Robin, very much for dedicating um, at least an hour of your weekend to at least have this chat uh, with us. And to the viewers, anyone that's more or less interested in the whole notion of product design and what it's about and the journey that you need to probably embark to get to uh, a point, a, a place in the two. Uh, Robin, uh, I think she's more or less um, giving you at least an insight in terms of what it takes. So um, at this point, I'd like to say thank you once again to Robin and to the All right. um, <laughs> Goodbye and see you in, in the next session. Yeah, okay, awesome. Good luck. <laughs> All right, cheers. <laughs> bye, bye, bye.